Okay, Steve, having been sucked into an internet black hole, I will, uh, I will just do this myself. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm Jeff Jacobson. I'm a partner at Fagery Drinker in both New York and New Jersey. Uh, I do a lot of consumer class action defense, and not all that long ago, I was in the New Jersey Attorney General's office running the civil division. So I've been on kind of both sides of investigations and prosecutions of, of the type that we'll be talking about today. So I hope that uh, I'm able to provide some interesting perspectives. Uh, for We can feel free to send questions at any time. I've got my chat box open. I'll let you know when we're a few minutes from the end of the slide. So if you wanna do questions as you think of them, that's fine. If you wanna do them towards the end, I'll give you a heads up that they're coming. Um, but with that said, I'll just kind of launch right in. So we're here to talk about price gouging in the pandemic. Um, folks who would have predicted that 2021 was going to feature a lot of class action litigation, a lot of AG investigations into price gouging would have been largely wrong. Um, there were investigations in 2021 into, you know, kind of relative small, obvious stuff, but big time investigations and big time cases were fewer and far and more far between than I think a lot of us would have predicted. But as I'll talk about today, I don't know that that necessarily means, and I think it, it doesn't mean that we've seen the last of this. In fact, I think we're still in the early innings of price gouging cases arising from the pandemic. So just to get started, I promise that this is the, the most dense slide I have. They get a, le a little less dense after this. And uh, LCA is going to circulate this presentation to anyone who wants it afterwards. So don't feel like you need to take down every word. But you know what's really wrong with the price gouging? You know wh wh why is price the price gouging statutes not a solid fit with the moment in which we find ourselves? Part of it is that that the anti gouging statutes were designed to deal with very short term emergencies. They were designed to deal with the kind of storm situation where what you were trying to do is prevent a supermarket from jacking up the price of batteries from five dollars to fifty dollars. None of these laws were written with the idea of a multi-year emergency covering a broad geographical area um, and potentially covering more and different kinds of goods than you would expect in a normal like storm-related emergency. So you have to understand that the drafters were contemplating at most a statewide or a regional emergency. They were never thinking about anything national. They were never thinking about something covering all manner of goods, and they were never thinking about covering an emergency that lasted this long. If you were leaving this to attorney general enforcement, you would expect that AGs were going to focus on what I would call, you know, core bad actors, people who were jacking up prices of very important goods higher than you can justify. But a lot of these statutes have private rights of action. And so it's possible that plaintiff's lawyers are hanging back and waiting to see what state AGs do. It's possible that facts just haven't developed in a way yet that allow for private class actions, but that tool is, is there, and I think we're going to see more of it, uh, in part because, as in, as in the little last box here, depending on the state at issue, the statute of limitations can be anywhere from three to six years after the emergency is over, and by the way, the emergencies are not over in most states. Uh, and if you're talking about AG enforcement, they may have 10-year statute of limitations, they may feel that there are no statutes of limitations on these cases. Um, also importantly, if you were thinking that 2021 was going to be a big year for AG enforcement, please bear in mind that a lot of attorneys general's offices have been working remotely this entire time and are only just now getting back into their offices. And so if their resources have been incredibly stretched during the pandemic to prioritize what they were doing, it's entirely possible they're going to have more resources to focus on these issues this year, next year, the year after than they have in 2020 or 2021. So that even though they have not brought enforcement actions when the gouging was really going on, they'll be able to look back at what happened and they'll be able to bring causes of action and potentially go after companies and try to get restitution after the fact. So, you know, when you talk about price gouging, one of the things you want to think about is what are we talking about? Obviously, as I mentioned, charging $50 for a $5 pack of batteries is, is what a lot of these statutes were going after. I mean, and if you're thinking about it, the laws of supply and demand don't stop in an emergency. 
And so if you are in a storm and a lot of people are trying to get out of their houses and into hotels, the hotels can charge essentially whatever they want. If you're looking for batteries, stores can charge whatever they want for the batteries on their shelves. And what government has done is say, you can't do that. We're going to artificially constrain the laws of supply and demand, and we are going to force you retailers to sell the goods on your shelf for about the price you were selling them before and not to jack them up in an emergency. And that means obviously people are going to suck them out of the stores as quickly as possible, but government has chosen that as a consequence as opposed to forcing people to pay more money for scarce goods and having the laws of supply and demand work the way they would work otherwise. Um, but the anti-gouging laws were not just written narrowly to target the $5 pack of batteries on the shelves. The statutes were written to be flexible, but it's that very flexibility that when you're talking about something like the pandemic creates a lot of uncertainty. I could talk about any of the states that have these laws, but I, you know, I figure I'll talk about New Jersey because it's a statute that I know the best. So here is New Jersey's law. And you know, I'll, I'll take the time to read it, but it basically is saying that it's unlawful to sell any merchandise which is consumed or used as a direct result of an emergency, whatever that means uh, in, in a particular emergency, or which is consumed or used to preserve, protect, or sustain the life, health, safety, fine, or comfort. Hmm, comfort, what does that mean? Who knows? Uh, at, a, at, a, at an excessive price increase. Now, the good news is they tell us what an excessive price increase means. An excessive price increase is a price that, that is excessive as compared to the price before, and they use a 10% uh, benchmark. So they say that if, you were, if you're charging more than 10% of the usual course of business price, and I'll talk about that in a minute, because if you had something on sale, it's pretty clear you can take the sale price down and increase the price 10% beyond the non-sale price. But then it also is worried about situations where you are reliant on a supplier. The costs of supply go up during the emergency. They allow you to increase your prices to follow what you are paying extra. So that if you have a $2 markup before, you can have a $2 markup later. But there are wrinkles to that that I'll also talk about this afternoon. That's New Jersey's. Just to give you an idea of if you're advising a, a company that does business nationwide, these are just a few examples of differences. In New Jersey, it's 10%. In Alabama, it's 25%. Alabama talks about articles of commerce that are necessary as a direct result of the emergency, which is kind of similar to New Jersey. California uh, is normally limited to 10% on emergency supplies, home heating oil, housing, transportation, hotels but then the governor issued an executive order that expanded it to food, medical supplies, consumer goods, and then anything that the federal government declared scarce, which would certainly include PPEs, personal protective equipment. DC uh, also has a 10% increase, but talks about the normal average retail price, whatever that means. Uh, Florida has 25%, uh, uh, the, the, the articles of commerce part of Florida is similar to Alabama, but they don't define what an unconscionable price is. Now, I'll skip around a little bit. Uh, Massachusetts and Pennsylvania take the time to say in their statutes that the law applies not just to retailers, but also to middle suppliers, which is very interesting because if, you're, if you don't extend the law to middle suppliers, the middle suppliers can jack up the price almost however they want, and the retailers are the ones left holding the bag dealing with these price gouging statutes. But in Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and some other states, they explicitly allow AGs to go after uh, everybody in the chain of supply. Uh, Texas is another example where they prohibit exorbitant or excessive prices during states of disaster, but don't define those terms at all. So you know, if you were advising companies, you would have to look at all 50 states. Some states don't have any statutes governing this. Uh, some of the states that don't have statutes tried to fill it in with executive order orders. It's not entirely clear how enforceable those orders would be. Uh, so it's going to be up to attorneys general in those states to flesh out what those executive orders mean, whether they can use regular state consumer protection statutes to deal with gouging. I think they probably can. Um, you know, again, just to, these statutes were just not designed for this. And I, I keep belaboring the point um, because 
if you anticipated a two year uh, emergency, you would not have written the statutes the way that you did. Um, because, and here's why, in many states, states of emergency went into effect in March or even earlier than March of 2020 have remained in effect. And in those states where price increases are not allowed during the entire emergency and potentially for a period of time after the emergency, you've got to ask yourself, does this mean that retailers have not been able to increase prices on goods covered by the emergency for the last two years under any circumstances? What about inflation? What about everything else that we're dealing with? How do the emergency pricing laws interact with the reality that we've all been facing for the last two years? So what's different? What's different is it's a national emergency. It's not regional. What's different is the kind of merchandise that counts as a direct result of an emergency is different in the pandemic than it has been in any other emergency we faced. It's not about lumber. It's not about you know, the things that it would be if it's a storm. It's about medical equipment and other kinds of, of just general living goods. And then the states that, are, that include comfort, whatever comfort means, it could mean anything. And that's the problem. And again, does, does this apply to you if you're just a retailer? Or does it apply to you if you're a, a, a wholesale supplier as well? That's going to depend by state. We know what the gouging laws are meant to preclude. We don't know what they weren't meant to preclude. So to give you an idea of what, you know, what these statutes were designed for, a lot of us rec remember Hurricane Sandy. We lived, we lived through it. It was a regional emergency that covered all of New York, all of New Jersey, some of the region. But to give you an idea, in New Jersey, Governor Christie declared a state of emergency on October 27th, 2012, right before the storm. The emergency was in place for only a month. So even though uh, you know, we remember Sandy as something that was very impactful, and people are still recovering from Sandy in a lot of respects, the state of emergency only lasted a month. And we remember what the principal problems were. It was power outages. A lot of us were without power for two weeks. We had real problems getting gasoline and there were shortages of household staples. And so you knew exactly what you were trying to prevent against when you were applying the emergency statutes during that one month period. Um, you know, but how do we apply those, those laws to COVID with, with forced business closures, not closed because the storm flooded the business, but because government said businesses had to close? What do we do when, because of those business closures, a lot of people who were selling goods to commercial entities had to flex and instead sell their goods to retailers? And what do you do when an emergency, A, lasts a long time, and B, is coming in the face of nationwide inflationary pressures, you know, again, this is all, I, unfortunately, I'm going to say, I don't know a lot during this presentation. We don't know uh, how this is all going to play out. So did these laws require businesses to freeze prices for the last two years? Maybe they did. I mean, assume a business couldn't hold to a less than 10% price increase for a covered good during the entire pandemic. What additional costs imposed by the supplier to use New Jersey's language could be passed on lawfully to the consumer? And then if you're thinking about this as a litigator on either side, how is the retailer or the seller supposed to account for those additional costs? Is this something, I mean, it, it, it would not seem to be something that you could take up on a motion to dismiss. And so how would a lawsuit play out if a seller has solid proof of increased costs? At what point would you be able to appeal to a judge to say, look, here's what I got. Can't we turn this thing off? We just don't know. Um, so, you know, I talk about bad facts making bad law. So there are all kinds of situations where sellers sell goods at certain times of year intentionally for a loss. A lot of us, I'm sure, have dealt with uh, meat companies on either side of the V. They routinely sell, uh, sell meat at a loss in winter and they make their money in spring and summer. So again, the pandemic set in when they were selling these goods at a loss. Does that mean that they have to maintain those prices throughout the pandemic? Who knows? And I mentioned earlier about if a seller is selling goods both to, uh, both to consumers and to commercial customers, what happens if you have to basically shut down your entire uh, commercial product line 
repackage the goods for consumer sale, a lot of different disclosures are required. You, the whole sales process is different. So if you're trying to, uh, you know, if you've got to lay off your commercial sales force, or you've got to retrain your commercial sales force, or you've got to do something else with your commercial sales force in order to both make the goods saleable at retail and to educate your sales force so they know what they're doing, what of those costs that you incur can you pass on to the consumer as an additional cost? So a question just came in that I, I want to answer now. Given your familiar, familiarity with the New Jersey Consumer Fraud Act, how do you think a price gouging claim fits within the prohibition of any unconscionable commercial practice, either as an AG enforcement action or a consumer class action? So the question refers to the New Jersey Consumer Fraud Act, which is already a very broad statute. Um, my suspicion is that a state or federal court in New Jersey would say that if you are violating the uh, price gouging statute in New Jersey, that that would be a de facto unconscionable practice. So I would view New Jersey as a state that would allow a private right of action for these kinds of issues. Not all states do that. New Jersey does, California does. Not all states have the same kind of borrowing provision. But I think that since the price gouging statutes essentially call it unconscionable, you know, that's, this is going to be a state that I suspect over you know, the next few years, we may see more actions than we already have. Um, you know, another question came in about whether these statutes apply to services um, and not just to goods. The answer to that question is, is almost certainly yes. But the question is, can you really call the service uh, an emergency good? I can come up with one example. There are certain, uh, and my parents dealt with this, there are certain companies that, that were coming to your home to administer a COVID test. And now, you know, the question is, were those services operating before? Is there a benchmark that you can compare what they're charging now to what they were charging before? But if they were coming to homes to deliver other services, and they're now charging a higher price because what they're delivering is a COVID test, you know, that would be something that I would imagine if the emergency is still in effect and the COVID test obviously being a scarce good, you could apply this to services and not just to goods. But again, you know, these are, these are going to be the kinds of questions that we'll deal with over time uh, because, you know, the, these, these issues will continue to come to light a year or two after the emergency ends and the statute of limitations will still be in effect. Um, you know, some couple more examples of this, you know, what if a retailer, and this, this is a, a real world issue that I'll talk about more specifically in a couple of slides, but what if you have a long-term supply contract that's tied to a market price index? The market price index is going to increase, some legitimately, some maybe illegitimately, because not all states have these laws and some retailers, some sellers, I'm sorry, are going to be jacking up prices in ways that are arguably unlawful, but they're doing it anyway because they don't think they're going to get caught. So the market price is going up. Can you still charge the index set price because the contract says so, even if the index price is giving you a much larger profit than you would have had before? It's an open question. And then because the emergency is lasting so long, you've got to think about, and this, this harkens back to what I was just talking about with the company delivering in-home COVID tests. If you were making KN95 masks before the pandemic, I mean, these things didn't just come into being because of the pandemic, they existed before. If you were selling masks before at a dollar, you, company A, are probably disabled from selling those masks at more than a dollar 10, uh, unless you can show that you've got increased costs. But company B that has never made or sold KN95 masks before, therefore has no benchmark price, what is stopping company B from entering the market at $2 each at a time of scarcity? Maybe nothing. And, and is that fair? No. Um, is it possibly the law? Maybe. I mean, again, we're, we, these are questions that are going to need to be tested either in investigations or lawsuits. Um, you know, to give you an idea, again, March 29th was when the CDC requested social distancing. They thought it was maybe going to only going to last a month. Uh, we all remember 15 days to stop the spread. Two years later, we're, we're still in a state of emergency. And what I think is, is frankly in, unforgivable is that attorneys general's offices in the main did not provide any guidance about what some of these terms meant. And I think that it is, it is unfair to expect 
good faith sellers to understand exactly what may be coming their way. And I would hope that when AG's offices start investigating this, when courts start examining private class actions, they will be mindful of the fact that sellers were without guidance from AG's offices and were having to apply these statutes uh, the best they could without knowing exactly which goods were covered or exactly how to uh, document increased costs, how to pass on increased costs when they could. So I mentioned before that I was going to talk about uh, you know, one of these, these supplier issues. The state of Minnesota, uh, in a very high profile way, went after uh, egg producers. So I'll, it, it's a very complicated case. I'll try to simplify it a little bit here. Um, you know, assume pre-pandemic that it cost a, a company $4 to produce a dozen eggs, and it sold the eggs to the next stage in the, in the retail process for $5, so it was pocketing a dollar. The pandemic would have driven up the company's costs in a lot of ways. Feed was going up. I mean, every, everything was going up. So assume that the company's production costs, instead of being $4, became $6.50 but the producer had a market price based contract tied to an index and the spot market price, the index price rose to $9. So these are not the actual numbers in the case, but I was using round numbers just to make it a little bit easier to explain. So instead of making a $1 profit, the index price was allowing the suppliers to get a $2.50 profit, which under the applicable law was too much because the, the applicable law only allowed for 20% price increases. And here the price was essentially doubling in, in reality. And according to the attorney general's office in Minnesota, uh, the spot market price rose by 150% at some points in time. So, and again, now remember, this is not a law. This was governor's executive order that applied that 20%. The legality of that would have potentially been subject to being tested the egg producers decided to enter into a consent decree. And it was a little bit of a heads I win, tails you lose proposition because what the producers agreed to is that if the spot market price dropped below their cost, too bad for the producers, they have to sell the goods at the market price. And they would not, by contrast, be able to rely on the spot market price when the spot market price increases they would be limited to the governor's executive order and they could not charge more than 20% above their, uh, they could not charge the more than 20% above their pre-pandemic margin. So, you know, what do we learn from this? We learn that an AG's office is absolutely 100% of the time going to go after a staple good that you need for basic nutrition. Uh, they are going to go after a, basic staple good where the price increase is 150% and the governor's executive orders at 20%. That's just too high profile of a situation. You're going to get too many complaints into your office. You're going to investigate that 100 times out of 100, and you're going to take action against it, and you're going to use the full force of your office to do it. And I think they extracted quite a consumer favorable settlement out of the egg producers. Um, what else is going to attract the attention of the of the regulators and the plaintiffs bars in the coming years? I don't know. Um, it's going to, you know, it, it will go beyond staple goods, but what else it will attract is going to be hard to say. There have been surprisingly few published cases dealing with these gouging statutes. I'm going to talk about basically all of them uh, over the next few minutes because they're easy, to, they're easy to find, they're easy to talk about, and there just aren't that many of them. Amazon is an obvious target of these kinds of statutes because of the wide variety of goods and the huge number of sellers that are using Amazon's platform. At the beginning, Amazon had the defense of its arbitration requirement, but in the middle of the pandemic, as a lot of you probably know, Amazon decided to retract its arbitration requirement. So a defense that Amazon had back in 2020 when the first case was filed, the arbitration requirement doesn't exist anymore. The case was refiled uh, in Washington, Amazon's headquarters as this Greenberg against Amazon.com case. Amazon is defending against the statute by saying that Washington law, I'm sorry, defending against this action by saying that Washington does not have a specific price gouging statute. 
that plaintiffs should not be able, this goes to the question earlier about New Jersey, plaintiffs should not be able to use Washington's general prohibition on unfair consumer practices to impose a hard maximum on price increases during emergencies. And you would really need a hard maximum in order to try to do this as a class action, because otherwise there'll be too many individual issues. Um, the motion is only just now fully briefed. It was fully briefed as of February 4th. Don't really know what the outcome's going to be. Um, you can see this going a lot of different ways. The plaintiff's position in the Amazon case is that it's just too early to take up Amazon's position that they ought to be able to take in discovery about Amazon's practices. They ought to be able to take in discovery about um, you know, how their sellers operated and it's just too early to give Amazon a facial defense. You can see that argument winning. You can see the logic in Amazon's argument. Um, besides Amazon, Walmart has faced a little bit of this we've seen from local authorities in California. It's entirely possible that Walmart is seeing some of this from in a non-public way from others. I think over time, all of the kind of big retailers are going to be dealing with this as well. And we'll see. A question just came in that, that's kind of worth pausing on here, uh, which is about car sales. And I've been wondering about this myself. I was kind of lucky enough to have put in a, uh, to have contracted for a new car kind of right before this jumped off. And I guess I should consider myself lucky that the car dealer decided to honor the contract price. Um, I guess he probably didn't have to, but he did. But we've all seen this idea of, of car dealers that are imposing you know, $5,000 $5, or even higher uh, market factors, markups on stickers. I, if I were defending a car dealer, I could come up with some defenses. I could argue that, that a new car is not an emergency good. Um, I, and, and it's never been considered one under, under an emergency pricing statute. I could argue that that new car on the lot is not a good that I had before so that you don't look at the price of last year's model, you're looking at the price of this year's model, which was effectively never sold without this markup. Um, I could argue that, um, you know, I've got increased prices and, you know, I, I, there, there's a few things I could argue, but at the end of the day, the sticker says what the sticker says, and a dealer is taking advantage of the situation and of scarcity to mark up the price by thousands of dollars. And I think that probably the biggest battle is going to be over whether the goods themselves are subject to the emergency pricing statutes. If they are, I think car dealers may have a problem. If they're not, they don't. Um, and you know, by the way, there are clearly some goods that are not. To give you an example, you know, if you if anybody who had kids uh, during the pandemic and were looking for things like swing sets or trampolines or anything that would allow those kids to recreate themselves in the privacy of your own yard, good luck finding those during the early stage of the pandemic when all kids were at home from school. Um, now, the statutes do talk about comfort. And I suppose if you really kind of squint at that hard enough, you could say that a trampoline is a comfort item or a swing set is a comfort item. Um, and you know, so if somebody was trying on Amazon or eBay or whatever to jack up the price of a swing set or a trampoline, I suppose you could argue that that's covered by the emergency pricing statute, but that's going to be a tough argument to say that something like that, which is clearly a luxury good, um, you know, it's sort of a first world problem. I can't get a trampoline, I can't get a Peloton bike, I can't get whatever. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's going to be hard to say that everything you might wish to have is covered by the statutes, but a lot of things that you, it gets closer to need you could argue that it's covered and cars, you know, if depending on where you live, cars could mean need. Uh, I'm not going to try to say, I'm not going to try to tell anybody otherwise, you know, go walk, go use public transportation. That's not an option for a lot of our fellow Americans. And so some cars on some circumstances in some states may very well be. Um, that would be an interesting theory to test in the right state. Um, Union Square supply against de Blasio. So this was a New York City enforcement action against a company that New York City alleged sold masks and sanitizer and gloves at ridiculously high gouging prices. And the store sued New York City saying, you can't do that. The 
you know, the, the statute is void, the, the, the regulation in New York City was void for vagueness and violated due process rights because $350 per violation was an Eighth Amendment problem. Uh, the court did not take very kindly to, <laughs> to those arguments. Um, you know, I, I commend this opinion to your attention because, you know, it, it, it's not, I, I've seen cases that drip with more sarcasm and disdain than this one, but I can't say I've read a lot of cases that have dripped with sarcasm and disdain more than this one. Um, and it, I think that this is illustrative of the kind of ruling that you're going to get if you're talking about an AG enforcement action directed against a core bad actor. I think the courts are going to give regulators a fair amount of leeway to go police against egregious violations of the gouging statute. I don't know, and I suspect not, that this kind of deference would apply to a private class action. I don't think this deference would apply if a regulator was reaching uh, far beyond the, the clear intention of the gouging statutes. But here where you're talking about masks and sanitizer in the early parts and gloves at the early parts of the pandemic, they're, gonna, they're going to uphold regulator authority all day, every day. Um, if you've been holding your questions, now would be a good time to start asking them because I'm coming to my last few slides. Um, you know, so we're probably, you know, I would say eight, 10 minutes away from my saying no questions, then have a good day. Um, next case, this Global Geeks against SCN. So this was a buyer of KN95 masks that was contending that the seller was violating New Jersey's and New York's anti-gouging laws. It's a really complicated fact pattern, but the, the facts aren't really important. What's important is that what the court said was it could not at the pleading stage of the case opine about what the pre-pandemic price of a mask was, what the during the pandemic reasonable price of a mask was, that all of this would need to be fleshed out in discovery. And I get it. I mean, I can't say that there's anything wrong with that decision. I can't say that, that it's fair for me as a defense counsel to ask a judge to stray from the plain text of Rule 12b to take in facts that the plaintiff himself didn't plead. On the other hand, and this goes to you know, what's going to happen in these cases, if you don't, if you can't get out of it at the pleading stage because it's just not a 12 beable defense, what does that really mean? At what point is it fair for a judge to say, okay, the defendant has come forward with enough evidence? At what point do we shift the burden onto the plaintiff to say, you know, what more do you reasonably need from the defendant before I can grant summary judgment? Um, and I just don't know the answer to this question. I mean, it, it would be in some kinds of cases against smaller retailers where you're talking about a small number of goods. I can envision that discovery would not be particularly complicated. And if I were the judge presiding over those cases, I would give the plaintiff some leeway on discovery. And I would say, all right, look, you know, let's let's take a deep dive into that good. Let's see what the retailers uh, costs of acquisition were, you know, let's, let's, you know, you take a deposition and then we see where we are and we go for summary judgment. On th at the other end of the extreme, if you're talking about an Amazon or a Walmart, where you're talking about potentially hundreds or thousands of goods, yikes. I mean, I don't know what you do in that circumstance. Um, because, you know, what kind of discovery are you really talking about here? Uh, it could be anything. I mean, it could it could go on forever, and so you know, I would I would hope that we're going to start getting some guidance, whether it's from magistrate judge decisions for ongoing cases, or you know something from somewhere, because if I'm right, and maybe I'm not, but if I'm right that there is going to be a wave of these cases coming in 2022 and 2023. It would be nice if judges had some guidance about how to deal with discovery in these cases, because particularly against the larger retailers, if discovery is just if, if you can't get dismissal at the pleading stage and discovery is just going to be unbounded, that's going to create what the Seventh Circuit would call a death knell case, you know, with just too much pressure to settle. And I don't know that that's the fair way to deal with this either, as much as I'm, I'm anti-gouging. 
Um, so, you know, this case is an example of you're not going to be able to get out of these cases at the pleading stage necessarily. Um, you know, I, but it's important for me to point out as well, the complaint here was not artfully, it, it wasn't pled artfully in a way to escape 12b6. You could envision a complaint where they don't talk about the price pre, they, you know, they kind of leave it to the judge's imagination to talk about what the price was pre-pandemic. If you see a complaint that is trying to be too cute by half, in that circumstance, you know, I would probably advise a company like this to put in indisputable evidence and do it and, and try to get a 12C judgment on the pleadings. You do a speaking answer, put in those documents, try to get a 12C judgment on the pleadings. Um, because I, I would think that maybe you could get a different result than you got here, um, but who knows? Uh, it's, it's again, you know, one of these things that we're just gonna have to see. Um, Online Merchants Guild against Cameron. So the Kentucky attorney, you know, this is another one, you know, good luck trying to, to turn off a regulator. The Kentucky attorney general commenced, commenced a whole bunch of price gouging investigations involving hand sanitizer, wipes, masks, all the, the usual suspect goods. Um, a consortium of Amazon sellers sued the AG of Kentucky to enjoin the investigations their theory was it violated the dormant commerce clause because Amazon doesn't have state specific prices. That if somebody's selling on Amazon, they can sell nationwide. So they contended that the Kentucky AG, and by the way, the Kentucky AG was far from the only AG to be doing this. And so I'm sure that other AG's offices were watching this case unfold. Um, the dormant commerce clause argument was kind of interesting, but ultimately not gonna get anywhere. Um, what the Sixth Circuit held was that, no, it doesn't, you know, applying a state anti-gouging statute to online com commerce doesn't violate the Dormant Commerce Clause, that yes, it's possible that by virtue of Kentucky enforcing its own law against Kentucky businesses, and that's important to pause on for a second, the Kentucky Attorney General, at the time that this complaint was brought, it was only enforcing against Kentucky headquartered sellers. So this was the Kentucky AG telling a Kentucky company that you can't sell goods anywhere above the price that Kentucky law would allow. And basically what the sellers were saying is, well, look, if we could have restricted ourselves to selling to the other 49 states, we would have, but Amazon doesn't let us. So by virtue of your enforcing Kentucky law against us, you're violating the Dormant Commerce Clause. And what the Sixth Circuit said here is, no, 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 no. Um, you know, yes, you've chosen to sell on Amazon. Therefore, you are giving yourself the ability to sell nationwide, but that doesn't excuse you from, try, from having to comply with Kentucky law. This, this too is something that I can say, you know, I don't have a problem with. I mean, this, this sounds about right to me. Um, that, and this is coming from somebody who's a, a, a fairly big dormant commerce clause guy. I think that when states, for example, impose requirements on, on companies to you know, deal with their, with their internet traffic in a way that they need to do nationwide. The Dormant Commerce Clause has some legs. This one, though, I didn't really see. Um, you know, that, those are, and that's it. Those are the cases. Uh, I was not cherry picking here. Uh, and I did another sweep yesterday to make sure that I hadn't missed anything that had just come down in the past uh, you know, couple of weeks since I put this presentation together. There really is not much out there. And what that means is either, you know, the pandemic is going to come and go and the years after the pandemic are going to come and go and we're not going to see price gouging statutes, or it means that we're just waiting to see what happens uh, in the coming months and years. So, you know, question, are we really only in the second quarter um, of, of what is going to be a four quarter game? I think maybe we are. Uh, those of us who were watching President Biden's State of the Union address, he mentioned that he is causing the Justice Department to appoint a pandemic fraud prosecutor. So this is something that's going to get the attention of the federal government. Uh, he was talking more about people who were taking uh, pandemic grants, monies, uh, and misusing them. But it's entirely possible that that federal prosecutor will go after gouging as well. I really do believe that state AGs are going to have more resources to focus on this in the next couple of years than they had during the pandemic itself because, and I know this just from talking to my former colleagues, 
they were they they had no time to do anything other than putting out four alarm fires over the last two years. And I think that when they're back in their offices and able to roll up their sleeves, look at the backlog of consumer complaints that they have, and start picking some targets, I think you're going to see more of this. And the FTC testified to Congress just early last month that it too is stepping up COVID-related enforcement separate and apart from what the Justice Department is doing. Um, if the Amazon case gets any traction, which I can't say it won't, it might not, um, that may portend cases against other large online marketplaces and more against the ones that are already being sued. Um, you know, I, I think that you're going to see prior to the time that the administration started sending out COVID tests free, having insurance companies cover them, all of that, there was that period of a month or six weeks right at the beginning of the Omicron surge where COVID tests were being gouged. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I don't know why we have not already seen a round of complaints. I would be deeply surprised if they don't show up in the coming months. Um, you know, it's sort of part of the strange dearth of cases. I just don't know what, uh, you know, what, why we haven't seen more of these. Um, maybe one reason is no one wants to be the first through the door and with a theory that makes bad law and, you know, they throw you out of the, the, plaintiff, the plaintiff's attorney's club. Um, so it, it may be that the private cases are waiting for the AG's offices to identify targets. I don't know. It's not that I haven't been talking to my friends on the other side of the V. Um, I, I have been. I've been getting some insight, but I haven't really gotten a, an answer that I've quite understood about you know, what they're waiting for. Um, they certainly have defendants in mind. They're just, they just haven't sued yet. Um, you know, companies with arbitration agreements may think that they're safe from these kinds of claims, they're certainly not safe from AG investigations. And you know, one thing that I've seen during the pandemic is that more plaintiffs, I mean, the, the, the mass arbitration field had been limited to a couple of firms prior to a year or so ago. Other firms are getting into this game. And if you are a company that deals with tens or hundreds of thousands or millions of consumers, it is not particularly difficult in the internet era for a firm that puts a little bit of money behind advertising to line up a thousand or 10,000 clients to bring individual arbitration claims. And so this is something that, you know, we need to keep an eye on that maybe these are going to be mass arbitration situations and not class actions. So with that, I'm actually done. Um, I haven't seen any more questions come in. I'll pause for a couple minutes. And Steve, I know you're, you're on now. I mean, it's, it's too late to introduce me, but if you want to uh, <laughs> say a few words, to our colleagues who are on the phone, I'll, uh, I'll get out of your way. Um, but uh, failing that, it's been a real pleasure. I hope I've uh, given you some food for thought. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of better answers, uh, but I hope I've, I've raised some, some interesting questions.